I mean, a book has clearly shown that all the countries in the world, they are supporting agriculture. So we cannot continue to support Indian agriculture, of course, also will all require the support. So we cannot continue to support the agriculture in the traditional way. We have, see, we have to see what are our priorities, how we can improve the, uh, let's say, the efficiency of the interventions and make use of available resources more efficiently so that we are able to get the uh, uh, right results because agriculture is still will continue to be a, I would say, the priority sector, both in terms of it is contribution making to the economy as well as this providing the employment and of course having the impact on the rural poverty. So with this, once again, I uh, thank all the authors uh, for coming out with this wonderful book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gulati. Um, thank you, Ekrayer. This is a great book, and I'm very, very glad to be uh, one of the discussants for it. <clears throat> you know, the point uh, I think the finance minister has made, I think Sanjeev Sanyal has made, as to why Rajat made as to why agriculture is so important. I mean, you know, not just in terms of its share of GDP, but more in terms of the fact that 60% of rural people are working in agriculture and things like that. So there's obviously that background. I think the other reason why this book is really, really topical right now is that with the elections less than a year away from now, this is the sector that the government is really focusing on. And despite what the, I mean, you know, Mr. Jaitley talked about this book being, you know, about supporting agriculture the smart way. This book is about how India has been supporting agriculture the dumb way, you know, all along. And it, it's a fervent appeal to say that, you know, let's not support it the dumb way. <clears throat> And you know, so one of the one of the big plans that the government has right now uh, is is this MSP based deficiency program. And I think we had done an estimate that that will cost about one to one and a half percent of GDP in a full year. You know, given the way prices are, which makes you wonder how the finance minister said on Saturday. You know, when the rupee was tanking, he made a statement that the government is committed to the 3.3 percent fiscal deficit. If if he's going to do this MSP-based plan, which he's got, there is no way that you know he can um, he can keep to that that budget deficit. So I think there's a huge problem there that we have in this MSP plan. In fact, today, uh, you know, we have a news uh, paper, a news item in our paper today, which says that in Karnatak, where the pulses crop has just come in, the prices today are ruling at about 25 to 30 percent below the MSP anyway. So basically, this is going to be a huge cost. One, one and a half percent of GDP is going to be the cost of this plan if it works out. And uh, this is actually going to worsen the point that Ashok is making, that Marco is making, in the, that they've made in their report that, you know, we are just spending too much money on subsidies and we're not spending enough money on investment. So I think, you know, it's very, very important that we're doing this. <clears throat> I think the other, plan, the other problem with the MSP plan, and this is again part of supporting agriculture the dumb way, is that this is going to have other externalities which go beyond just the fiscal deficit impact. So if you look at cotton, for example, after the latest increase in MSP, almost all India's cotton-based exports, that means cotton itself, cotton textiles, cotton ready-made garments and stuff like that, that's I think about 20 odd billion dollars is our exports of these goods right now. That's 20 billion dollars worth of goods that are likely to be under threat because of one great policy that we've come up with, we just increased the MSP of cotton. We export another $8 billion of rice, thanks to the huge jump in the MSP of rice. That's another $8 billion of potential exports that is under threat. So, you know, as I said, the point that, you know, you're making, Ashok, is that you're talking about subsidies being, you know, crowding out investment. I'm just saying that we are, we are embarking on a policy which is going to increase the subsidies dramatically and which is going to reduce legitimate sources of income for farmers, which is going to make them even more dependent on the government of India for subsidies. So, you know, we are, instead of getting out of this trap 70 years after independence, we're getting deeper and deeper into the trap. You know, that's the, the sad reality. I think one of the big points that Ashok makes, you know, <clears throat> I think the finance minister pointed this out when he spoke, that everybody knows what there is to be done in agriculture. Everybody knows that these subsidies are harmful and, you know, Subsidies come at the, expense, at the expense of investment. 
I think the greatest contribution of this book really and of your research at a career for a long period of time is to quantify some of this. So, you know, so for example, we know, thanks to your research, that India does not have a problem of money. Money is not the problem that India has. So, you know, you put a number, I think that if you look at the implicit tax that India has put on its farmers over 20, 2001 to 17, over the last 17, 18 years, is about 14.4%, I mean, it's reduced in recent years, but it's about 14.4% of agricultural GDP. Now, you compare, compare this tax on agriculture with the subsidy that we give, which is about you know, 8% today. So you're taxing agriculture by 15%, and you're giving them a subsidy of 8%. I mean, you know, it's pretty obvious that the subsidy that you give is worth nothing. I think the, you know, the, the other important point, and the reason why we need to keep this in mind is that all of us, especially people like me who work in pink papers, whenever there's an agricultural loan waiver, you say, they have a farmer, they've got 30,000 crores. They look at what Aditya Nath has done in UP. This 30,000 crores or 40,000 crores or whatever this is actually needs to be put in context of what you don't allow the farmer. So if, you know, if to use your number, we actually didn't allow the farmers to get 15% of, I mean, if, if we had not put those agricultural export bans and farm, or we had allowed people to move their grain from one state to another, if they had got 15% extra, then they wouldn't need these agricultural loan waivers. I remember you wrote this article in the Financial Express where you said that the loan waiver in UP was actually nothing but three years of not getting the MSP for wheat and rice. So you don't allow them to sell at the market price, so that depresses the price. Then you promise them that you'll buy at MSP. You don't have the money or the ability to buy at MSP, so the farmers lose out, and then you give them a loan waiver and you expect them to be grateful. You know? So <clears throat> I think that's, you know, that's a very, very important part of what you said. I think it's frightening, and I don't think the finance minister really addressed this, you know, but when you talked about the issue of agricultural R&D, I mean, obviously the finance minister is right that the government of India is putting a lot of money on rural roads. They're putting a lot of money on, on, on irrigation, which is a good thing. If, as your, your research shows, that agricultural R&D is the biggest source of you know, improvement for farmers, what have we done in India? Since the Modi government has come in the last four years, we have systematically gone after the biggest R&D. I'm sorry, it's not Syngenta. But uh, we've, we've gone after Monsanto. We've tried everything possible that we could to drive this company out. From putting you know, caps on seed prices, from putting caps on royalty, from even claiming that the patent is illegal. I mean, the additional solicitor general actually told the high court that the Monsanto patent for cotton was illegal under the Indian Patent Act. It's there on affidavit. I mean, you may not believe it, but that's the extent to which we've gone and driven out agricultural R&D, and we talk about you know, doing a lot for the farmers. I think one of the, one of the you know, which I, th I, I think one point which is very odd, <clears throat> you haven't focused as much on it in this particular book, is really the amount of money that you can save by using more DBT, you know, when it comes to PDS and things like that. If you actually start doing DBT, you can disband FCI, you will no longer have a you know, WTO problem. So that's another area where, unfortunately, you don't find enough work going. The Modi government has actually been very, very proactive when it comes to DBT. They've done a lot more work than the UPA government on direct benefit transfer. But for some reason, when it comes to agriculture, the DBT has been very, very limited. So, you know, I, I mean, you brought up the issue of how we need to you know, use more drones and uh, things like that to, to make uh, agricultural insurance payments faster. I think we need to do a lot of that. So, but the, the broad point that I want to make is that the government of India continues to waste money on supporting agriculture the wrong way. A lot of those policies now, because as the finance minister said, the government has more money than in the past, thanks to you know, larger tax collection and things like that. Thanks to the greater amount of money the government has got, it seems to be driving us into a bigger trap. And I think this MSP system, if it works, I mean, the good news is it may not work. So if it doesn't work, then it doesn't matter. But if the government's MSP plan actually works, then we're in really, really serious trouble. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Some very interesting points have been raised. And I request the editors, Dr. Gulati and Dr. Ferroni, 
to take the discussion forward by responding to the observations of our discussants and also to further explicate some critical findings. Thank you very much, Anisha. Let me start by thanking the Honorable Finance Minister for giving very good advice, observations, comments on the book, and hopefully we'll remain in touch on a number of other issues. I'd also like to welcome some of the new persons who have entered the room, Subhash Chandraji. The debate that has come, and uh, uh, Sanjeev, some of the comments that you have made, let me start by something, because we have a special chapter on China, and the reason is very clear. There is no other country in the recent, you know, last 50 years that has done such dramatic changes. Today, China is very different than when they started off reforms. China started off reforms in 1978, primarily from agriculture. 78 to 84, six years, they focused primarily on agriculture. What did they do? Two things. Not 14 volumes uh, on uh, agriculture reforms. They dismantled the how, uh, community, the commune system, which is pretty well known, and went for the household responsibility system. But what is less known, they used to suppress prices of the farmers like us. Because of poverty, always keep the prices low. That was the philosophy of the socialist era, and keep it, and they gradually liberated that. They said, enough of it. What happened in those six years? In those six years, the real prices for agriculture started taking a lift. And agriculture growth for those six years, agri-GDP grew by 7.1% per annum. But the farm incomes, because the real prices were liberated for agri-produce, increased by 15% per year real incomes of the farmers. That's the only country, literally, which doubled their farmers' real incomes in six years, and poverty was halved in six years. Halved. We took 18 years to half our poverty. They did it in six years. Now, besides this poverty alleviation impact, through agriculture growth, something different happened. If you imagine the economic pyramid as agriculture where the largest number of people are, industry and services, the traditional one. This, when the income increased of the largest number of people, it got political legitimacy for further reforms. They asked for more. Dil mange or. And secondly, it created a huge demand for industrial products from bicycles to two-wheelers to TV sets to refrigerators and all that, many of these things were being produced by town and village enterprises, so they had to scale up to meet the demand which was coming from the bottom of the pyramid. And later on, they captured the international markets and all that. So the political legitimacy of reforms, and because the largest number of people gained first, and the industrial goods demand base was so much. I think that's the reason our China chapter is included when people say, oh, they are at a different level of income. They were below us on per capita income, even up to 81. They have lesser area than us, gross cropped area, as I said, 166 million hectares versus 198 million hectares, but they are producing double, more than double of cereal output, four times fruits and vegetables, and eight times India's meat production. Now, this is, again, a lesson. You said calories. We have been calorie-based. 66% of our calories literally come from, uh, uh, she's sitting there who is doing a lot of work on that, uh, on the cereal side. But that is changing. And that's going to change as income levels come up. You're not going to consume from four to six chapatis. You're going to consume from four to three to two. And what will add on your plate is more of milk and milk products and meat products and fruits and vegetables. So more and more protein. Where is the problem in India? 
we will not go the Chinese way because Indian meat eating will not be as large as the Chinese. Chinese people need 200 million tons of cereals as their feedstock. We work with 25 million. And with the current environment, I don't think Indians will go in any big way for beef or uh, uh, for, uh, you know, that's a big change compared to the Chinese system. And the reason for that is that Western world, which went in for more of red meat, uh, beef, the conversion ratio that is needed, seven kilograms of grain needed to produce one kilogram of meat. Chinese went for pork more, and that is about 4.5 kilograms to one kilogram of meat. Indians, all the pressure that is going is primarily on the poor chicken. And there, the conversion ratio is very efficient, 1.6 kilograms to one kilogram of this. So I think our food safety wall is our chicken. <laughs> you know. But we need safe food, food safety. So the infrastructure that is needed and that's what will create employment in the rural areas. You know, we created infrastructure somewhat for cereals because we were so short of cereals. But for milk, milk processing, we are the largest producer of milk in the world, 177 million tons, but we are processing only 21, 22% of that milk. So a lot more has to come in. I think that's where the potential of growth is, that's where the potential of employment is, and that's where the potential for poverty reduction is. So we are looking forward to a revolution. Uh, there is a young lady sitting there who is working on innovations and revolutions in agriculture, uh, how it has happened in dairy through the milkman of India, and more when uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee de-licensed the dairy sector so cooperatives don't have just the monopoly power and it took a further flight with the private sector, the strength of it. So that's going to come, uh, definitely, cash crops. I think the biggest revolution in the Indian agriculture in the last 15 years, if we may say, from 2002, 26th of January, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee took a very bold decision and that is concerned with this topic. He allowed BT cotton, the first GM crop of India, to be commercially cultivated. What happened? In 2002, we were more or less self-sufficient, marginally deficit, marginally surplus sometimes in cotton. Today, India is the largest producer of cotton in the world. Uh, yeah beating China now, largest producer of cotton in the world and second biggest exporter of cotton in the world. If you look at what happened between 2003, 4 to 16, 17, we estimated the cumulative gain that because of this decision of Prime Minister Vajpayee, 67 billion dollars worth of extra gain that the country had in terms of exports, cumulative besides the income augmentation of the farmers. Now, let me come to that income augmentation of the farmers. Which state got the biggest benefit of this decision? Gujarat. Gujarat, when the Saurashtra region got prosperity, they brought the chief minister back and back and back three times. So it's good economics, it's good politics. You can dovetail. If, but it's not just technology. Remember one thing. Technology alone will not succeed unless you have the markets for it. If you had banned exports of cotton, there would have been a crisis. And they tried to do that for one month and there was a crisis. Even now, ups and downs, but we are at a very, very different level of cotton. So cash crops, I think, Technology, whether it is coming from the private sector. Sunil said we have done everything to drive away Monsanto from where the BT cotton came in. I think the message that we have here is that you have to create a friendly environment for IPR protection if the private research is coming from outside. Our whole ICR system, I think the budget, annual budget was 6,000 crore, 7,000, less than a billion dollar. These big six global companies, we showed the graph, are spending $7 billion a year. 
and much of it is on research. So the future of research is going to increasingly come from the private sector and that would need some IPR regime that is friendly. We also want our farmers to access those technologies at affordable prices. Now, how do you negotiate? Because they have a monopoly, they would like to keep the seed prices very high, the government says, farmers say we can't afford or afford or whatever, but we have to work out in a way, and that's, again, we look at the Chinese example, what did they do? They bought Sanjenta. So Marco, I don't know whether you were in those negotiations at that time or not, 43 billion dollars. A PSU of China, Camp China, literally took over Sanjenta because it wanted to ensure for the next 20 years, 30 years, access to best technologies, whatever they had. And without changing the name. They are not changing the name, nothing. All these people are still representing Syngenta Foundation or Syngenta. But things have changed. Can India do this? If we have big pockets, it is the access to technology. Either you spend in your own ICR system, China's public system spends 1.3% of agri-GDP on agriculture research. This is the latest data we have got from Jikun Huang, just the paper I received last week from him, 1.3%. Ours, Suresh Paul said, 0.4% of agri-GDP goes for research. If you add extension and all that together, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 0.7%, Anisha, right? 0.7% of agri-GDP. So the U.S. is coming up with 3%. So you can imagine the more you invest in research, you can be uh, doing the other point that you put on the table, which we have not dealt very much, uh, the climate uh, change and the resilience of agriculture that would be needed. Otherwise, you will be wiped out like Harappan uh, uh, civilization or others, and that's true. But again, research will give you the answer that in the, those civilizations, they had buffer stocking of grain or in the tanks, if you look at... Uh, you know, uh, the southern part of the country, this is how they used to. We are depleted. Uh, what we have done to Punjab, it's literally a crime we are doing. Uh, 70 centimeters per year, the water table is going down. And we are the largest exporter of rice. One kilogram of rice means 5,000 liters of water. We have exported last year, Shweta, 12.7 million tons. Even if you net it out, some recharge of water and all this, you take minimum 30 billion, 40 billion cubic meter of water you have exported from the country. Can India afford that? Because we are not pricing our power properly, we are not pricing our water properly. All these things ultimately will have to be corrected and this is where our main issue is that research can help you but prices have their own role to play. And unless we tackle that, it's not going to change the system. Now, one question that you raised then, why do we go for more subsidies and less of investments? To me, to the extent I understand the political economy, the horizon of the political masters is very, very short. And they feel, today, if I do loan waiver, I may get some more votes, and I may win back. You know, you can announce even the last year higher MSPs, <laughs> whether it will be implemented and how far. So it's a very short-term horizon, whereas for investments, they have to wait for the returns to come. So maybe they invest and somebody else reaps the gain. I think this is where the dilemma of political economy vis-a-vis -vis the policies that we have on the ground uh, so we want somebody to rise above this very short-sightedness and get into focus. It's alarming that the rate of, I agree what you are saying, that it's not possible to eliminate subsidies, input subsidies, especially when you are taxing your farmers on the pricing front. But first thing is correction on the pricing front, liberate the, you know, ban the ban on exports or allow the private sector to operate fully so that they get a benefit of that. Uh, I hope we don't get into the deeper trap, as uh, Sunil was saying, with MSP. 
Uh, we don't want to go the Chinese way on that account. That also is, uh, they went in for very high MSPs and then they have to accumulate 300 million tons of food grain stocks. So I think that is a learning also from China. Don't go that way. <laughs> go for the income policy, perhaps less distorting. So our overall uh, thing is, yes, uh, at the margin, if you are giving subsidies maybe at 2%, 3% growing, investment should be growing by 8%, 10%, so that in relative terms, we start correcting uh, the system uh, for a bigger bang of the resources that we spend. Otherwise, India will have a tough time. I think I'm not pessimistic on India's story. Uh, I feel the worst has been over. We will have aberrations here and there. We have seen 1960s where we were, and today we feel so comfortable. We have seen 91 with $1.4 billion in pocket, and now with $400 billion in pocket. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> in a way, that means the system can be improved further. <laughs> but we are in a much, much resilient state today on the financial resources, and I think I would say what the finance minister said, that that issue that we don't have resources at all, or we are very tight, perhaps those days uh, are behind us, and we can definitely make improvement on that. So I'm grateful to the discussions, to uh, Sanjeev Yu especially coming over, and of course to the finance minister giving us all this time. I think we have an open session on this. Uh, if there are more questions, you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The floor is now open to a question and answer session. I just request everyone to please have written questions on paper slips that can be passed on here. And you can hand them over to me or to the career representatives here. I think the floor is open. If there are any questions, just give us one minute. Uh, I have received so far only two questions. If there are any more, you can jot down. And if uh, you also mention your name, that would be great. Uh, how will government incentivize investment in agriculture from policy perspective uh, to the private sector? Uh, whose question is this? OK, great. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's OK. And I represent uh, an NPO. Uh -huh. uh, my name is Sarobindo Malotra, and I represent a Utrecht based uh, uh, NPO called IDH, uh, the Sustainable Trade Initiative. Mm -hmm. Good. 
let me try to respond to this. And Marco, please feel free to uh, come in any time. Uh, the question is, how will government incentivize investment in agriculture from policy perspective to the private sector? Uh, let's discuss two parts of this. One is private sector investment in agriculture, which is primarily by the farmers themselves, the households. That's by definition. Then there is private sector investment for agriculture, which relates to uh, you know, the infrastructure, the value chain, the cold storages, and others, where the corporates can come in and uh, invest in that. I think on the corporates question, there are certain schemes, certain subsidies on capital and so on and so forth that is coming in. But certain laws also need to be changed. For example, in storage, if you want more investment to come in. Now, if you have Essential Commodities Act on one side, which says government can order any time that within one week everything has to be unloaded in the open market, otherwise you'll be put behind the bar then who is going to invest? Because if I'm investing, I'm investing for the next 30 years. And I don't have the certainty because the private trade is still seen in this country. You know, if I'm keeping a little more stocks, oh, hold up. So he's going to rig the market and therefore raid. This happened in onion, this happened in several other commodities. So nobody wants to store large quantities and therefore when the production increases, Typically, thing is, because the warehouses are not there, private sector is not allowed to hold larger stocks, uh, prices collapse. That's the typical problem. So I think first and foremost is Essential Commodities Act needs to be revisited, made it much lighter. Second is what we call the APMC Act, where the, there is a monopoly of the, uh, you know, those APMC markets. So if we can allow direct buying from the farmers, create a value chain which directly buys from the farmers, bypassing the mandi system. In milk, you don't go through the mandi system. Fruits and vegetables, that's the typical one of the problem. But you have to start with grading, packaging, you know, uh, all those investments that are needed. And I think Government has started off a little, uh, in this very budget, uh, they have started off something called uh, uh, Operation Green, top for tomatoes, onions, and potatoes, three commodities. Uh, let's see where it goes uh, ultimately. But one of the idea is to build value chains because these three commodities keep on giving you trouble. Either the prices are too high or too low and so on and so forth. So that's one of the... I didn't get the second question that you had, role of government in conveners, PPP, what is it? As, as was mentioned uh, during the dialogue, uh, public and private partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the access to the... But, but the access to the uh, government and the outreach to the government stays limited. And hence, uh, uh, from what we have experienced, the PPPs uh, are not easily achievable mm -hmm. here in the country. So, so still, the, the private companies like PepsiCo's and Coke's of the world are working in isolation, mm -hmm. uh, increasing the calories uh -huh. while sourcing potatoes rather than sourcing and investing in increasing the proteins, as you rightly mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there is a disconnect here. Uh, I think that you take it uh, to the extent I understand that that's a potential area for major investments. Private sector investments after delicensing of the dairy sector, the private sector investments are growing at double, triple the rate of the cooperative. This is going to happen in the meat sector also. And, uh, you know, major players have come in from production to processing to others. So I feel next 20 years, 30 years, if you take that horizon long, uh, many of the private players are entering in the meat sector, milk sector, fruits and vegetable also it will come. But you are right that connecting with the farmers 
whether through contract farming or some other arrangements, uh, still in the country, uh, the trust factor between the corporates and the farmers groups, uh, it's a little uh, tricky part. Uh, more transparency is needed, but there are many success stories that you find in different commodities, different parts. I think that will get scaled up, that's what we feel. Uh, okay, good. All right, uh, how about the implementation of crop insurance policy in smart way? Uh, this is from, okay. Well, uh, Mr. Suraj Hassan is an uh, expert on, uh, who started off the new insurance uh, uh, system in the country. Uh, I think there are ways in which technology can be employed. But before technology, I think one big thing that is coming up, uh, farmers, if they have to have trust in the crop insurance, because it is heavily subsidized by the government, many a times farmer doesn't know whether he's insured or not, <laughs> and therefore who will get the compensation at what time. You know, we evaluated uh, the two seasons of the new crop insurance, Pradhan Mantri, Fasal Bhima Yojana, and we found if the state government has not given premium, how do you expect the companies to give compensation after the damages? So I think from the information that you are insured by such and such company, SMS has to go. It should be compulsory so that farmers are aware because the moment you deduct a premium on his loan, loanee farmers and all that, first is farmer must be aware. And then second, the law says within 15 days of the damage, the crop assessment, damage assessments have to be done. Technology was not employed. So it's a very, uh, I would say, uh, very imperfect way we have implemented. Uh, hopefully it can improve. If not, government is giving a subsidy of 22,000 crores a uh, year back on this. Uh, many farmers are not getting full advantage of this, so we may have to revisit on that. Uh, third question is, how does the government plan to incentivize a shift to cultivation of coarse grains, uh, given suboptimal public procurement and distribution in staple cereals like wheat and rice? Ashwarya Chaturvedi. Uh, okay. You know, you cannot drive a system if you think core cereal is good, you want to drive that way, you have to look where the demand is going. If wheat and rice are much cheaper and easier to cook and all that, this is how the whole shift took place. But where you can bring some correction, rice requires a lot of water. And in Punjab, if you are not charging for water or not charging for power, then you are creating a bias in favor of water guzzler crops. I'll give you Maharashtra example because that's where core cereals are there, sorghum, and you have sugar cane. One kilogram of sugar means 2,000 liters of water. 4% of the cropped area of Maharashtra takes away two-third irrigation water of the state, two-third. So the entire prosperity which is represented by water actually is concentrated with 4% of the farmers, 4% land. Now, either you charge proper price of water or you distribute equally water, you know, quantitative restrictions, and let there be a market amongst them who wants to grow, who wants more water, then you have to pay for that. Now, if you don't do that, this is what will be the result. So just they are going through MSP increases. I'm not sure whether that will lead to a situation where people will start eating more of core cereals. So uh, that's what my, our take would be. Authors and discussants told that subsidies in agriculture sector are going to continue. Should we exclude the big farmers targeting of subsidies? Arvind, from a reset. <clears throat> you know, if you look at, 
85% of the farmers in the country are less than two hectares. There have been studies that on the existing cropping patterns, if you have to make an economically viable farmer, you need four hectares. You know, even two hectare voila, cannot really, unless you are growing fruits, vegetables, or something like that, high value crops. But cereal based system, and 60% of the area is under food grains, more than that. Now, whether you can exclude big farmers, the number of big farmers is small. Whom do you call big farmers? In the international literature, anybody below 10 hectares is small. In India, we have a land ceiling. In the WTO definition, anybody below 10 hectares is small farmer. It is our definition, we say less than two hectares. And if you have to exclude only 5% of the farmers, you may have a system which is, you know, higher the land area per hectare, he will be getting lesser and lesser. So one can do that. If political economy works, totally excluding them, fine, great. You know, all those issues can be, we can discuss that. I'm just giving you what our feel is. So, <clears throat> yes, they need to be targeted. And I would always go for direct DBT so that it goes directly to their account. And then you charge full pricing for whether it is fertilizer or water or power and so on and so forth. That will give you a much better system uh, and do justice. Does China's political system have anything to do with whatever reform measures the country has been uh, talking, taking in such a uh, fast speed manner? Can we take all such measures that much quickly in India? You know, normally we have this debate or China they can do anything without consulting farmers and others, <coughs> and India being a democratic country, uh, we can't do reforms. I think that's an excuse. Yes, you must have discussion. You must show that the reforms are getting results. Now, if you start reforms from the top, where only the better ones gained, have you heard of any agriculture reform package? The reforms in 91, what were they? Exchange rate correction, delicensing of the industry, big one, and trade tariff reforms. Nobody heard of agriculture reforms in the country. So you are starting with the top layer in the pyramid and the better ones gain. So Bangalore techies may have international salaries and they have gained, right? But have the farmers gained? When the majority has not gained, there's no political support to reforms. Now, blaming that to democratic setup, I think we started with the wrong you know, side of the reform process. That's what I was saying. China, they started with the bottom layer, they gained the maximum, and they asked for more. So I maybe at times, you know, China can because the land is owned by the state, so they can shift people here and there. But if you have a good compensation system here, the problem is your compensations are so low to the farmers when you are doing the land acquisition, and you voluntarily ask for, give a good price, people will be for coming forward to do that. So I think it's more with the understanding of the reform process and how we approached it. We did not approach at our wish. We were forced to do reforms because of the foreign exchange crisis. Let it be clear. And by stealth, we changed a few things along with it. So that's how we had. How is, if ever, we move one of the subsidy and MSP? Impacts in terms of private investment in agriculture, crop diversification, etc. Ashutosh Sinha. Okay. I don't think we will move out of uh, subsidies totally, but at the margin, you know, you can change the ratio. As we are touching now 8, 9% of the agri-GDP 
in terms of input subsidies and our public investment has been falling. I think that is what we need to change uh, in a dramatic manner. Uh, so I don't think India will have in the next uh, 10, 15 years uh, zero input subsidy or even in the next 20 years. But the ratio can be changed, that's what. MSP, this is very interesting and again I go back to the Chinese system. You know, we have MSP for 23 crops. And I happen to serve that institution which recommends MSP. And when I started doing that exercise, not even two crops, government was able to give MSP beyond five, six states. So Haryana, Punjab, Andhra, we tries, and then you go last five, six years, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, and to some extent in Orissa. That's the end of the story. And tar from east of Lucknow all the way to Assam, prices of paddy would be invariably 25% below MSP. So I fought the system. If you have a policy, why don't you implement it? No way, I failed miserably. And Siraj Hussain was the FCI chairman when I was the CSEP chairman. <laughs> and there is a question the state has to do or the center has to do and all those things. <coughs> so we could not implement even for two crops beyond five states. Now we want to implement 23 crops all across the country. One viewpoint was Sunil said, it is only an announcement how far it will. But there are many people who are very serious. No, no, we have to do it. Otherwise, what is it? China had earlier four, five crops. Wheat, rice, uh, uh, corn, at times cotton. Uh, last year, they gave up, uh, no, 2016, they gave up corn. They said we can't because 300 million tons of stocks. So massive inefficiency in the system, much more than what you need. So I think we have, we will burn our hands. We will accumulate uh, pulses, uh, reserves of 10 million tons within a year or two. There will be high cost of that. And then we will have to decide how, you know, you want to give to the farmer, which is good. So the intention is good, but what is the policy instrument you are using? And this is where we are saying, learn from the best practices around the world. People have moved from price policy approach to help the farmers to income policy approach. So that will be less distorting, much more economically efficient, and still you can do justice. And you can reach the small farmers through this. Because if you do price policy, it's basically those big ones who have larger surplus, they will be the ones gaining. Now, who will gain maximum from wheat and rice uh, higher prices? It is the Punjab farmers, not those small farmers. So income approach, you can still reach uh, the small farmers in a much better. Okay. Uh, what would be best blend of good politics and good policy in the agriculture context? Soham. What would be the best blend? That's what we were discussing at the margin. You start as a proportion to agri-GDP. At present, you are at 8%. Agri-GDP will keep increasing. If you can freeze in nominal terms and relative terms as a percentage, it will come down to 7%. And at present, your public investment in agriculture is 2. 2%, 2.3%, can you make that to 3% and 4% and 5%? So I think we have to change the gears. Go slow on the subsidy front, if at all. If you cannot reduce, reducing is going to be a big challenge unless you convert that entire thing into an income approach per hectare basis because there are massive leakages in the system. So you can save on those leakages and then directly give to the farmers and they'll be fine. But politically, it has to be sold. And that's, I don't see any leader. Our political leaders, they are more keen on announcing loan waivers or higher prices as if that is going to change the world. I don't think, this is where Sunil was saying, you are going to get into a deeper trap if you have more resources and spending like this. This is where the book's analysis uh, hopefully will help. You know. Does India require land consolidation or can we do without it going forward? 
land consolidation. I think before land consolidation, if we can allow at least freeing up the land lease markets, most of the states do not allow even that. The tenancy is prohibited. So if we can allow that, then economically viable size of the holding will start emerging in the system. Okay, I have two, three more, and then we have to wrap up if you want food, <laughs> food security. Uh, so. Yeah, I've already crossed time. Okay. Uh, please comment on the following observation. The trading community has a lot to answer for in its negative impact on farm income. The angst of seeing uh, products sold at measly prices being resold at three or four times the price received by a farmer is totally discouraging to him. The only way to reduce trader margins is to encourage FPOs to set up processing units. Compensation, a comparison with China has become a norm now, but India has a lot to learn from Thailand, particularly its focus on FPOs, on grading and standardization. Yes, uh, you know, in milk, uh, I don't know, it's you? No. Okay, you know, uh, two, three things. In case of milk, I think world has to learn from us. Amul says that they give 75 to 80% of the consumer's rupee to the farmer. And the value chains were built with cooperatives. It doesn't go through the Mundi system and all that. It's a very good success story of inclusiveness and still comparative, and, but it, we have a long way to cover on that. But in fruits and vegetables, we have failed miserably. And that's where farmers get uh, one third, one fourth, the price that the consumer is paying. I think that's where value chains need to be put in place. It's not necessary. This book gives the example of China. I have worked on Indonesia, Thailand, and uh, Indonesia has similar structure of uh, farmers, uh, producers, organizations. They will collect, everybody will bring there. They have created an infrastructure right at the back end of the farmers. People bring three feet cemented platform with a shed. Everybody with a you know, member of that group will bring the produce, it will be washed. And then there are 10 ladies sitting grading and then it will be packaged. There will be a barcoding of that. And within 24 hours of harvesting, and then the retailer's van will come at 4 o'clock. By 6 o'clock, it is in Jakarta. And you have that system. And they get about 30. There is a study that we did in my earlier incarnation with IFRI. So there is a system. So people are getting 60%, 70% of what the consumer is paying. And I think that is what we need to get into. And I gave the example that government is trying now at least streamlining three commodities, uh, tomatoes, onions, and potatoes. I wish them good luck. Uh, it has to start with standardization, grading, and all these things, so I fully subscribe to that. Uh, okay. What about marketing reforms? Uh, why should not Modi government aggressively take up this issue for a common agri-market? He should do like he had done for introducing GST, uh, there should be no excuse, uh, Ashok Sharma. So you have given the answer to your question. <laughs> it should be done like GST. And that's, uh, we have been saying this. Uh, in fact, finance minister has repeatedly talked about this, that the biggest return on reforms will come from agriculture if this is done like the GST. I think the Prime Minister has to call all the Chief Ministers on the table and then get his Agriculture Minister in place uh, smartly to lead that uh, entire thing. And uniform market and agri-market reforms will pay much more than perhaps technology at present. Because this is where they are losing. It's not a matter of production. You know, till the time we were in shortages, we needed technology to increase production. That phase is seems to be over, and we are in a phase of surplus.
So you need better marketing reforms and nothing like that, like a GST, you have to steer it. So PM, this could have been the best and the easiest way. You are ruling in almost 21 states. So if he had called in the beginning, it would take a year to streamline those things, what the losses and the, you know, what the commission should be and what the market fee should be and what infrastructure investments would be needed. But this would be a low hanging fruit. We haven't done it. So we'll keep, I hope I have covered all the questions. If any question is missed, I apologize. Uh, we can still continue over that. Uh, would you like to take over now? Thank you. We've come to the end of the session, and I would like to call upon Mr. Prakash Apte, Chairman Syngenta Foundation India, to kindly give the closing remarks. Dignitaries on the dais, dignitaries in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. I want to be very brief. It has been a very interesting session this morning. And, um, you know, Syngenta Foundation usually works on the field and uh, essentially takes, uh, takes projects which are there to improve the income of the farmers. This was probably for the first time that we took up a project which was focusing on policy research. And uh, it was good uh, that we were fortunate, I should say, that uh, we had partners like uh, ICRIAR and we had somebody of eminence of Dr. Ashok Gulati leading the, uh, leading the project. A lot has been said about the recommendations and, uh, uh, and the whole discussion here this morning. Uh, it shows that the effort clearly was, uh, was very worthwhile and this book will, will continue to contribute to the debate on this important subject, uh, you know, of subsidies versus investment. Uh, in a very timely, book has come out in a very timely manner. Just a short word about how the, what impressed us, you know, from Syngenta Foundation, looking at how the, how this study progressed. Uh, if I mistake not, there were three or four phases. First, it was only the uh, discussion on the agricultural uh, fertilizer subsidies, and uh, then there was the credit subsidies, then there was a discussion on the insurance, and then there was the discussion on the irrigation subsidies and other subsidies. And at each, fa each phase of the project, I think what the project team did uh, was to have a workshop, you know, get the people who know about uh, this the best, the practitioners, the policy makers, the, the research uh, community, and have an open debate. I did attend one of, uh, one of these uh, debating sessions, so to say. So I have a feeling that the, this dialectic approach, which was taken by the, uh, by the research team, certainly has added, you know, a, a lot of value. And therefore, I would also like to thank all those who must have participated in these sessions. And last but not the least, uh, to Dr. Ashok Gulati, who led this process of the idea synthesis after every phase, phase of the process. I have no doubt that it has, it has helped making this book and the findings much more meaningful. I would be missing in my duty if I don't mention uh, thanks to our own uh, Marco Ferroni who at that time was, uh, was heading the Syngenta Foundation. And I think it was his idea, uh, supported by my colleague Partha Dasgupta, to try and do something on the, on the policy, uh, you know, research, and, uh, and try and contribute in that area. Uh, so thank you, Marco, for, uh, for giving us this, uh, this push in this area coming away from the field. Thank you very much to all the authors. Congratulations to them. And last but not the least, also I must put on record our thanks to Honorable Finance Minister for agreeing to release the book. And thanks to all of you and the discussions for the lively session this morning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request Mr. Rituraj Kapila, Director, Academic Foundation, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, knowing speaking almost last, I have to be very short, though few people have already left, but I must place on record our gratitude. On behalf of the Publishers Academic Foundation, I express our gratitude to the Honorable Finance Minister Shri Arun Jaitley for so kindly releasing the book. 
this important work rather. And uh, we express our deep gratitude to Dr. Kathuria and of course to ICRIER for organizing this wonderful event and making us a part of it. Thank you so much for your continued support. We are extremely grateful to Professor Ashok Gulati, the lead co-author of this book, for his sustained confidence and trust in academic foundation and giving us this opportunity to publish the book. Our association with Dr. Gulati goes back nearly three decades. And in this period, we have actively engaged in several publishing projects. We remain indebted to you, Dr. Gulati. Thank you. I wholeheartedly thank our second co-author, Dr. Marco Ferroni, and also Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, Syngenta India being represented here by Chairman Sri Prakash Apte, for their encouraging support and participation in today's event. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal for his special remarks, and thanks are due to Sri Suresh Pal. Our big thank you to all the discuss, uh, discussants, Sri Suresh Pal and Mr. Sunil Jain for their val valuable participation. Finally, thank you everyone for being here. The book is on sale outside. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Pilati, would you like to deliver the final word of thanks? <laughs> no, I think uh, I owe it not only to the finance minister, all of you, the discussants here, Sanjeev, a big thank you. But I do want to recognize, can you stand up, the young ladies? <coughs> Pritha, Prerna, we had, <laughs> they have slogged and slogged at least on six chapters, a big input coming from them. Uh, insurance could not have been completed if uh, Siraj was not with us because the beauty of that was that Siraj who started off